I'm Dr. Paul DeGramji. I'm a family physician at Collegeville Family Practice in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Today we're going to talk about shift work disorder. So why is it important for us to know what shift work disorder is and what's the big deal about it and why should we have a high index of suspicion in some of our patients who come in complaining that they're tired. Before we want to know about shift work and shift work disorder, we need to know something about normal sleep. Everybody knows that the uh, important thing about sleep is that you get the right amount of sleep. A, all family doctors know this, all clinicians know this. If you don't sleep too long enough, problems are going to occur. We also know that good quality sleep is important. So if you're sleeping long enough, but you have interrupted sleep, either something is doing it to you, like a dog or a cat or a sick child, or worse yet, a medical problem like restless leg syndrome, or rather periodic limb movement disorder, or maybe even obstructive sleep apnea, this is poor quality sleep. We all know that that's important. But what we're talking about today is not the quantity of sleep or the quality of sleep. We're talking about the timing of sleep. It turns out that we have a circadian rhythm uh, to our sleep. What that specifically means is that we have a 24-hour or one-day varying kind of rhythm to our sleep. There's a point where our brain wants to be awake, and there's a point when our brain wants to be asleep, and this is kind of set for us, and that's why we call it circadian rhythm, circa diem within a 24-hour, one-day rhythm. And most people's brains are set to about a 25-hour clock, uh, but because of some external forces, specifically sunlight and day and night, it's about 24 hours. And most of us will have this set time that we kind of know about. Uh, and this is why most of us will wake up pretty much the same time every day with or without the alarm clock if we're sleeping normally. Also, with our circadian rhythm, our brain will tell us when it's time to go to sleep. So for example, somebody that's relatively normal, may wake up regularly on a daily basis at around 7 a.m. And at around 11 o'clock at night, eight hours before, the person may get sleepy and would want to go to sleep and within 15, 20 minutes or so falls asleep. That's normal. That's normal timing of sleep. There are some things, though, that can disturb the timing. And for the most part, these are things that we do to ourselves. And that's when all of a sudden we don't match our brain clock to our uh, the clock on the wall or vice versa. We don't match our, the clock on the wall to the clock in our brain. And this is a misalignment. Now, what can happen then or as far as the consequences, it's important to understand what good normal uh, sleep timing does. Good normal sleep timing will allow all your body functions to also uh, function normally. Uh, it is not just our sleep which has a 24-hour variation in, in timing, but also all the other organ systems rely on the brain's 24-hour timing of sleep. So when we're going to bed at around 11 o'clock and waking up at 8, so are some of our other organs varying what they're doing with this 24-hour cycle. The liver, the kidneys, the spleen, the circulatory system, uh, the brain, the CNS, all these have a 24-hour varying kind of a rhythm. And when we start to disturb that, disturbing things happen to the body. So it's not just um, a problem with our sleep that occurs if we vary our sleep timing, but other organ structures can also start to exhibit problems. So let's talk further about what happens when we disturb our sleep timing. The most common thing for this is when we all of a sudden decide that we are going to be awake and do things when our brain expects to be asleep. So again, using the, uh, the previous example, our brain wants to go to sleep at 11, but we say no. Between 11 and 2 o'clock, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to stay up and I'm going to do work on my computer or something on a regular basis. Or I'm going to actually go to work five days a week, I'm going to do that. Or worse yet, between 11 o'clock at night and 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go to work and do a shift work. So our brain clock is set towards being asleep then, but we're saying no. I'm actually going to be awake and do things. So all of a sudden, a little dyssynchrony occurs. A lot of dyssynchrony occurs. So dyssynchrony, lack of timing, and misalignment, that's what's going on here. So we are telling our body to be awake when it should be asleep, and we're telling it then, okay, now I want to sleep. Let's say we come home 8 o'clock in the morning from our work, 9 o'clock we want to go to sleep, but our brain says, normally I'm awake at around this time. How is it that you want me to go to sleep? A problem can occur. Now, in some people, they can adjust. Their brain clock says, oh, I see what you're trying to do, and within a couple of days or a week or so, it can adjust. But in some people, it doesn't, okay? So shift work is when you are working, when your brain wants to be asleep, and you work, and you try to sleep when your body and brain want to be awake, and that's, that's shift work. Shift work disorder is something where the body and brain can't adjust. And typically, this occurs after the body tries for about a month or so, and we're still having problems. And that's a definition of shift work disorder here, is after about a month of doing a particular shift where you are working when you want to be asleep, 
and when you want to sleep, when you should be awake, it doesn't work. Uh, during the, the, the work period, you're really tired, you're drowsy, you, you're, your brain isn't working well, you're making, let's say, errors, etc., depending on what work job that you have. And then when you come home and you try to go to sleep, you may have trouble sleeping. It's either one or the other, or in a lot of cases, both. That's shift work disorder. Okay? Now, it doesn't happen in everybody. And like I said, the majority of people can adjust. Within about a week or two, they can adjust. They can say, oh, I get it. You're trying to sleep now. All right, I'll see what I can do to adjust. Your brain clock kind of adjusts. But in about 15% or so, plus or minus, I think that uh, depending on which literature uh, statistic you look at, I'd say about 15% or so, maybe up to 25% of people will have trouble adjusting. Now, interestingly, uh, some people have a harder time adjusting than others. Older people, those with comorbidities, those do specific kinds of shifts that are very varying, these people will do much worse. Or people that have other sleep disorders, they'll do worse. So maybe their rate of having shift work disorder is higher than those that are young and healthy and don't have any problems. They may not have as likely of developing shift work disorder. But suffice it to say, one out of four, one out of five will just struggle and have problems aligning themselves. So how do these people present to us? Well, the interesting thing is a lot of people in this country do shift work. I mean, just think about it. Clinicians, me medical people, emergency room physicians, OBGYNs, internists, hospitalists, etc. In my field of practice, there's a lot of people who do shift work. Okay? People in the, uh, uh, the police force, they do a lot of shift work. Those that are involved in food and, and hotel, etc., they do a lot of shift work. So a lot of people in this country do shift work. So one of the things that we need to know as clinicians, as primary care clinicians like myself, what we need to do is when somebody comes in saying, I'm having trouble sleeping, or you know, I'm, I'm tired throughout the day, or both, one of the things that we will, oh, well, some of the things that we'll always ask is, well, tell me about your sleep. But one of the things that we have to ask is, tell me about your occupation. What do you do? You know, when do you work? Uh, and, and it's interesting what can come up. Well, uh, well, I, sometimes I work late at night. Sometimes I work during the day. I change my shift. Oh, so you're a shift worker. Well, yeah, I work in a factory and, and that's the shifts that I have to do. Or I'm an EMT. I'm a medical technician. I, I work in, a, uh, in an emergency room ambulance service. So sometimes I do nights, sometimes I do evenings, sometimes I do days. I vary it. It's important to know that. And then you can understand why the person may be suffering from problems with either sleep or daytime fatigue or both. Now, when a patient comes in with this, some of the other problems that we have to look out is that uh, if they are chronically or habitually doing shift work as the months and years go by, they're likely to develop medical problems. We know that shift workers, for example, have a much higher probability of psychiatric disorders. They have a higher probability of depression. Also, if they have any kind of psychiatric disorders, it may worsen it. Okay? So we have to be on the lookout that when people don't sleep when they're supposed to, okay, and they are working when they're supposed to sleep, some psychiatric disorders may occur or some may worsen but also medical problems. We have to be uh, attuned to that fact. People that do shift work have a higher probability of peptic ulcer disease. Their blood pressures have a higher probability of going up. They have a higher probability of gaining weight or maybe even insulin resistance, blood pressure elevation. These things may happen. So it speaks of what I said earlier, that the timing of sleep and the timing of wake isn't just what's happening in your brain, but all the organ systems in your body, all the organ structures in your body. So when that timing is disturbed, problems can occur in all those organ systems, all those systems in the body. Again, as I said, cardiovascular, metabolic, psychiatric, all these problems can occur. So when our patients come into us and they're tired, they're having problems sleeping, and they're doing shift work, look at their medical problems. Do they have high blood pressure? Do they have diabetes? Do they have obesity? Are they struggling with their weight? Are they struggling with any of these medical conditions? We need to understand and we need to inform them that their shift work, their timing issues may be causing problems medically and not just with tiredness and insomnia and even psychiatric disorders. So what's the first thing that we do when a patient comes in with tiredness and we understand that they're having problems with their sleep and daytime energy and we think that it's shift work and we diagnose them with shift work disorder? The best treatment for shift work disorder, get them off their shift. Get them to, to uh, align what they're doing throughout the day and night with what their brain clock wants to do. Now, unfortunately, that can't always happen. Okay? A lot of people say, I can't. I mean, the, my occupation is such that I have to work this way. I have to do shifts. I have to do night shift. I have to do day shift. I have to do rotating shifts. So as a result, we, we have to then help our patients do one of two things. One is to either see if we can re-entrain them. 
Okay. What I mean by that is see if we can shift their brain clock so that it can get synchronized with what they're doing. See if their brain clock can actually feel sleepy uh, when, when they want to sleep and be awake when they want to be awake. And we have ways of doing that. Okay. But at least what we should do is try to lessen symptoms as well. See if we can make them more alert during their shift and see if we can help them go to sleep when they're trying to go to sleep and also look at their comorbidities and see if you can address them as best as possible. Again, keeping in mind that the best thing, there's nothing second to, uh, uh, to uh, re-entraining things, that is uh, shifting your, your, your sleep and wake situation to match your brain's clock. Okay? But if you can't do that, then you have to mitigate as many symptoms as possible and look at the comorbidities. Well, let's talk about shifting your brain clock. What can we do to do that? There are two main things that we want to look at. One is melatonin and the other one is light. Now light will, help, will, will tell our brain to wake up. And there are specific ways where the light goes into our eyes, goes into that part of our brain, which is the master brain clock, which I haven't mentioned yet, but I should, which is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's our master brain clock. It tells us when to wake up and when to go to sleep. Okay, it also tells all of our other organ systems what the timing is that we are currently going through. Okay. The sunlight or any kind of light can tell the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it's time to be awake. So what we can do is if we expose the SCN, if we can expose our eyeballs into this SCN of light, it'll give a signal to the SCN as to when it wants to be awake. So when you want to be awake, you want to expose yourself to light. On the other end is melatonin. Melatonin tells our brain clock, our suprachiasmatic nucleus, it's time to go to sleep. So introducing the SCN to melatonin says, oh, you want to go to sleep. So let's say a patient, for example, who wants to do night shift, okay? And they're really struggling with it. Uh, their, their shift is 11 o'clock at night to seven o'clock in the morning, and they are tired throughout their night shift. Then they come home and they can't get to sleep. One of the things that we can tell them is this, here's what we're gonna do for you. When you get home, on your way home, the first thing we wanna do is remove light from your exposure. Use bright, or, or use sunglasses, okay? Uh, 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 so that you are shielding your brain from any kind of light which tells your brain it's time to wake up. So on your ride home, put on sunglasses. When you come home, try to do some relatively inactive things, sleep friendly things, and then get into your bed about the same time, let's say around nine o'clock. And around then it may not be a bad idea to take some melatonin, okay? You take some melatonin and it can help your brain clock say, it's time now to go to sleep. So no light and then melatonin. You may actually find yourself falling asleep a little bit easier. And there are studies that show that when you give somebody melatonin, you can really re-entrain their brain clock or at least help them fall asleep a little bit better, okay? And, and what you wanna have that person do then is to get a good amount of sleep as long as possible, five or six hours, if possible, even eight hours to shift their brain clock so that when they go to sleep, is it around, in this case, let's say nine o'clock and then they wanna wake up at around maybe three, four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So then the person is gonna to go to work. At around 11 o'clock is, is when the patient starts their work. At around 10 o'clock or so, or nine o'clock, you may wanna expose them to bright light. And that's a good idea to help them shift their brain clock to be in the awake situation. Also, when they get to work, if possible, have it as brightly lit as possible. And if you do this for a week or two or three, you may help the person re-entrain their brain clock so that eventually they may not need melatonin, they may not need bright light. But at the very least, what this may help the person to do is to lessen some of the symptoms. The light may lessen their drowsiness throughout their working hours, and the melatonin may help them sleep. Again, in some patients, they may not be able to re-entrain themselves, okay? So you're lessening some of their symptoms. You're hoping, though, that they will re-entrain their brain clock. One of the other things that you want to tell these patients to do is to try to keep their weekend hours the same as their work days. Okay, or work nights in this case. Okay? Sometimes they can't do that because you know, they have some social obligations, etc., and that may interfere with re-entraining themselves as good as possible or lessening their symptoms. But they should do the best they can to keep their wake hours and sleep hours not just consistent throughout the workday and night, but also throughout the weekends. Now, in certain instances, uh, we wanna go to pharmacologic measures other than what I just mentioned, like melatonin. In some people, caffeine is a good idea during their, their shift. Okay. And, and caffeine given in small doses throughout the early to middle part of their sh shift may be a good idea. Something like a quarter cup of regular coffee that you take every hour or so. But stop drinking the caffeine or coffee about two hours before your shift. And then you want to obviously not have any caffeine at all after that so you can help get to sleep. Caffeine is not a bad idea. 
And then for sleep time, it's not a bad idea in some cases to use sleep medications. There is one study with one sleep medication that may actually not just help you sleep, but maybe improve your, improve your alertness a little bit. But shifting back to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the work situation, there are medications that also actually may lessen the drowsiness that can occur during shift work. There are some people, like I said, that just can't lessen their drowsiness no matter what they do. They sleep better, they're taking melatonin, they're working with, with light and, and sunlight, uh, and they're even having caffeine on board and it's not working. In, this, in these situations, there are two prescription medicines. One is modafinil and one is armodafinil. And these medications can be effective. There's a lot of studies that have been done that show that taking either of these medications about an hour or so before the shift can help you pretty much have a much better time with alertness throughout the entire shift. Modafinil works, uh, or I'm sorry, armodafinil works a little bit longer. So depending on the shift, you may want to choose modafinil or armodafinil and the duration. But either one is indicated for the treatment of drowsiness for shift work disorder. So let's Take this example again of this person that comes to our office who's tired and they're doing shift work. They're working 11 o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning. And you tell them um, that to use sunglasses in the morning on their way home and, and they do sleep friendly things. They take their melatonin as soon as they get home. An hour later, they try to go to sleep and they try to get an anchor sleep as much as they can. And if they can only get six hours or so, maybe take a two hour nap um, several hours before you go to, to, to work. That's also a good idea. So if you can't get the eight hours, uh, then you can get two hours a little bit later on in the evening. You can do that. Supposing we're doing that and we're also using light, you know, right after they wake up from their nap or in the evening so that they're waking up and they're trying to face shift them and they're still having problems, okay? And we're, uh, again, that's a situation where we can use modafinil and armodafinil. When would you follow up on them? Well, these people, you want to see them on the early parts relatively frequently because you want to walk them through this sleep problem and wake problem uh, because various conditions can occur. Say, for example, he'll come back and say, well, you know what? I, I am doing the caffeine bit of the melatonin and, I'm still, uh, and I still can't sleep at night. Again, that's when you may want to use a sedative hypnotic on top of the melatonin until they can phase shift. Or supposing they'll say to you, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting six hours, but I'm still drowsy you know during my shift or, or rather what else can I do to get as much sleep again what I said earlier is getting that nap uh, if, if they're gonna go to work at 11 take the nap at around between 9 and 10 o'clock no later than 10 and not too long of a nap okay because if you sleep too long for your nap you'll have sleep inertia your body will kind of get confused again again what we're trying to do is to keep sleep as regular as possible and tries to phase shift and if not phase shift at least lessen symptoms what we're trying to do here Another example may be the, of the person who says, oh, geez, you know, you, you really helped me out. Uh, I'm sleeping from 11 to 7, but now I'm on day shift. What do I do now? Well, again, in that person, you want to give them the same kind of advice, okay? All right, now what you want to do is you want to go to bed at 11. Fine, what we're going to do is at nighttime, I want you to not expose yourself to light. Keep it as dim as possible. Take melatonin about 10 o'clock at night before you want to go to bed at 11, okay? And then when you get up in the morning, try to get up at around 7 o'clock or so and expose yourself to bright light as much as possible. Hopefully there's sunlight out and you can open the curtains and have the light come in and make sure you expose yourself to light. In some cases we have to use artificial light and that's when you can go on websites. There's various websites and even uh, medical supply stores where you can get a, a light box or, or a small portable sun uh, light lamp that you can use. Now typically you want to use about 10,000 to maybe as much as 20,000 lux for about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe even a half hour in the mornings if you want to phase shift. Okay. Uh, but again, in most people, a week or two, maybe three weeks, and they can eventually phase shift. So that's some of the kind of small intricacies that can happen in our patients. But once they phase shift, they'll do well. And hopefully what they've also done is learned the importance of the timing of sleep. And in some people, their brain clock and their body clock and the clock on the wall just doesn't get it. And that's when you need to help them. And the critical symptoms to remember for shift work disorder is either sleepiness throughout their work schedule or throughout their waking periods and or insomnia, trouble getting to sleep and staying asleep. And no matter what they do, they're unable to get things better and it's going on for longer than a month. Hopefully what you learned today is a little bit more than what you know about sleep already, which is the quantity of sleep is important. You know, for the general person, it's about eight hours plus or minus one hour. That the quality of sleep is important. You can't be snoring or stopping breathing or having the other kind of issues in the middle of the night, but also timing of sleep. We have circadian rhythms. Our brain clock, which is governed by our suprachiasmatic nucleus, gives us a nice diurnal variation. And that synchrony is critical. And when we disturb the synchrony, problems happen. So let's appreciate the fact that the timing of sleep is very critically important to our good health and well-being.